to our series, Faith, History, and the Craziness of the 21st Century. And we're going to be talking a little bit about both today, or all three, I should say. And uh, uh, I had something planned to talk to you that I thought was very apropos uh, about George Washington, how he dealt with the smallpox uh, pandemic that was in uh, the colonies during the Revolutionary War, but decided yet to talk about a book I've made reference to several times in our last uh, couple of uh, sessions, and that is Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. And uh, been reading it again, and uh, it's a very good book. I would encourage you, when you read it, if you read it, and I encourage you to read it, do so with a highlighter and a pen, because this is a book that you're not going to give away. It's a book you're going to refer back to if you care anything about uh, democracy, uh, about freedom. This is going to be a book that you refer to. And I, it's funny, I, in, in my research, uh, I always run across quotes by Alexis de Tocqueville that uh, politicians especially give. And, uh, and both liberal politicians and conservative politicians uh, use Tocqueville. Uh, but uh, much of the time, uh, they are not catching the full spirit of what Tocqueville is, is really trying to communicate. And to give you an idea who he was, he was uh, born into an aristocratic family in, uh, in France, um, went to school, became an attorney, uh, thought about going into the church and, and being a clergyman, but uh, decided to become a, a, an attorney, go into law instead. And, uh, and then along came the French Revolution, and uh, after the revolution, he was given a, uh, a position uh, in the government uh, concerning uh, uh, law and using his expertise. And so the premise of which he came to visit the United States was to come and to visit the uh, prison system within the United States at that time. We were just a fledgling nation. The American Revolution had been fought and won. And so uh, the French Revolution came after, just on the heels of the American Revolution. In fact, uh, I will be one of the proponents that say the uh, French Revolution uh, was inspired by the American Revolution. And, uh, and so Tocqueville came with a, a very good friend of his, a colleague and worker, they came to uh, uh, observe and to inspect the penal system um, of our nation. And, uh, and when they did that, after they did that, they wrote up their report. Tocqueville sent his colleague back to France with the report, and he decided to stay on, and he stayed on uh, another nine months here in, uh, in the United States uh, visiting. Um, all of the states and, and the, what would have been the frontier at the time, and uh, did venture some into Canada, but not very far. But he wanted to get a feel for uh, the United States and, and uh, how this republic uh, was going, how it was established, and the influences that it had on everyday lives of, of American people. And he was very impressed with it, by the way. And so uh, when, when he uses the word democracy in his book, he is not using it as many do today. Uh, we are a, a, a republic, a democratic republic. We're a constitutional republic, actually. Um, and, and the people have a say. Uh, the reason that uh, it's not majority rules uh, it is a, a constitutional republic that uh, has made a, 
a good home for democracy for 245 years. Um, now that's being challenged. And, uh, and some of those that are challenging our nation are throwing around the word democracy and, uh, and it does not have the same meaning that it had with our founders and with Tocqueville. And uh, it doesn't even have the same meaning that, uh, uh, I won't say Merriam-Webster's dictionary because as we found out in the news, they can change definitions or create them uh, depending on who's sitting before the uh, sub subcommittee for being uh, interviewed for the Supreme Court. So uh, very disappointed in them. But no Webster, uh, his and Daniel Webster, their, their books, their, their uh, uh, dictionaries would not have defined democracy like those who are throwing that word around today. Um, there is a move toward socialism in our nation, and it, and it has me concerned, and it should have you concerned. It should have every citizen concerned. Problem is, is that our citizenry uh, isn't concerned about a lot of things like that. And so uh, we just kind of left it into the hands of uh, the politicians. And so now uh, our politics have devolved into uh, this uh, great, almost a boxing match verbally. Uh, and, and amongst those supporters, actually, physically. Um, and so it, it's devolved into something that our founding fathers uh, would be highly disappointed in. Uh, but there's a lot of things happening in our nation that our founding fathers would be highly disappointed in. But none more so than uh, our politicians, our our. Uh, our legislators and even our Supreme Court justices um, would not, our founding fathers would not be pleased with uh, how our country is being led by leaders that we, for some odd reason, vote them into office. Uh, and, and I'll just be honest with you, uh, because I'm not in the pulpit, I'll, I'll share my... Uh, feelings with you quite openly. Uh, I think that, that uh, uh, we have created an, uh, an, a political aristocracy in, in our country. And uh, people like Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, both Republicans and Democrats should not be in office for 40 years. Uh, they should serve two terms, just as they had made the decision in 1951 to limit the presidency to two terms. They should be limited to two terms. Um, and I think that the, the Supreme Court justices should have a mandatory retirement age of, uh, of 70 and, uh, and, and move that along. Uh, those are just my opinions, but they're based historically, not just opinions, they're based historically on the reason why, uh, like Supreme Court justices, was a lifetime appointment. It's because uh, the justices, if you lived to 45, you were an old man uh, in the early days of our nation. And so uh, most people don't realize that some of the justices that were appointed by George Washington were 23 years old. Can you imagine being a Supreme Court justice at 23? Uh, it, it just, you know... Uh, People, the life expectancy wasn't very long back then. And so uh, now we live, seems like, till we're too old. Uh, and, and we've got uh, justices seated on the court that shouldn't be there. And so I think, uh, uh, you know, a mandatory retirement age of 70 and uh, would be good. And it would still allow uh, them to be on there if they got on voted on when they're 40 or 45 is still give them good, you know, 30 years, 25, 30 years of service as a Supreme Court justice. But Supreme Court justices are, they're just supposed to interpret the laws that are made by 
the legislator. They're supposed to interpret them in light of our Constitution, whether the laws are constitutional. Uh, they don't do that today. Now, some of our Supreme Court justices, unfortunately, uh, the liberal ones mostly, uh, have begun to uh, uh, go beyond the, the bounds of interpretation where they are now applying uh, constitutional rulings to stuff that uh, should not be so. Uh, and prime example is the Affordable Care Act, or we know it as Obamacare. Uh, they, there was a split decision on that. It went because the, the Chief Justice at that time uh, said, or who wrote the ruling, I think it was Roberts, uh, wrote that ruling saying that uh, they, could, they could view it as a, as a tax. And that is just absolutely ridiculous. He went way beyond his authority as a Supreme Court justice. And you might be thinking, well, Jeff, what, what gives you the, the right to criticize? Uh, because he's forcing us to purchase. We have to purchase something. Uh, they are forcing us to purchase something that, uh, that we should not have to be forced to do. Um, and so, uh, overstepping their bounds and each time uh, a major event uh, comes into being uh, before the court they seem to there there seems to be a segment of them that need that tend to stretch because of the political uh, polarity of our nation we are a, a nation that cannot have differing opinions anymore if you're a conservative like for me, I'm a conservative, white, uh, male, Christian. I am on the endangered species list uh, in, in many circles in our nation, which is unfortunate. And we can't even have conversation that is uh, uh, in an opposing manner. There's no longer debate. Uh, the presidential debates are a mess uh, on both sides of it. And so uh, they don't debate. They uh, argue, and there's not a neutral moderator. I've not seen one yet. So uh, our nation is in a, a critical state. I, I share, I wanna, I've want to. i been reading Tocqueville, and, uh, and there, I highlight things and then write in the margin. Uh, but I'll, I want to read uh, uh, s uh, some excerpts from this. Uh, and and then give you some comment and uh, and if you have comments I urge you to email me um, you're more than welcome to do that um, and let me know your your thoughts your opinions uh, I'm okay with those who have differing opinions than me but have a reason don't just say well you're stupid uh, because, you know, that may be true in some circles, but uh, n not in most circles, uh, because I think for myself. And, uh, and so I want to share with you what Tocqueville wrote, because uh, he's getting ready. This is the introduction. This is his introduction. Uh, and it's quite lengthy, the, the whole introduction. I'm not reading the whole thing. Uh, but... I am going to read, and he is coming now, he is writing, going to talk about America and democracy here, but he is writing, having gone through the French Revolution and lived through that, and, uh, and realizing that uh, they have democracy in its purest sense uh, is, is good, but... Uh, left to its own devices, left to just mob rule, it becomes just that, mob rule. And so uh, here's what he writes, though, and I thought this was interesting. But as we have left behind the social conditions of our ancestors and have cast behind us their institutions, ideas, and customs in one confused heap, what have we put in their place? That's the question he puts to it. So I'm going to stop there. He's talking about, we've gone through the French Revolution. 
we've cast off the uh, the authority of our ancestors, which would have been king, uh, monarchy. Uh, we've cast those off. We've cast off uh, uh, the social conditions, the institutions, uh, the church even lost some influence there during the French Revolution. Uh, the ideas of, of uh, feudal lords and, and nobility and aristocracy uh, and the customs. Uh, there was no longer that recognition of the, those customs and traditions that had been a part of France's life for, uh, well, since its inception. So, but he asked this question, what have we put in their place? They're supposed, this was supposed to be a democratic revolution. But he's seeing, because he's part of the government, because he has a government job, he is now seeing that we haven't, re we haven't put anything better in its place. The idea of democracy is better. But if you do not truly have uh, democracy at the heart, he realized that democracy is a fragile thing. It can be twisted. And it can be perverted, just uh, like we're seeing today in our nation. It could happen. And, and he saw that that was uh, looking like that was going to be the case in France. He goes on to say, The renown of royal authority has vanished away without being replaced by the majesty of laws. Nowadays, the people despise authority while fearing it. And fear now extorts from them more than respect and love achieved formally. And so what he's talking about is he says, we, we got rid of the monarchy, we've got rid of, rid of the royalty, but we haven't replaced it with, he uses this descriptive phrase as the majesty of laws. They were not putting into place the laws. One thing I have learned to appreciate about our founders that so many in our government don't appreciate is the fact that our founding fathers uh, saw the importance that we would be a country of laws. And they put forth a constitution and all the laws are supposed to be based on the constitution. It's the constitution that governs us. And so he says, nowadays people despise authority while fearing it. I put in the column, I put right in the column, I wrote, this is America today. What do we see? You turn on the TV, you turn on the radio, you can't, I mean, my goodness, I can't even watch a YouTube video without there being a commercial about uh, uh, Antifa or Black Lives Matter or some other group out there that is afraid of the police, supposedly, yet they attack the police. Uh, we, we see f commercials and read articles and have news reports about defunding the police and doing away with law. In fact, I have even heard one of those crazy uh, ladies in the squad in our political system, I won't, I'll let you guess which one, saying that, you know, laws just really aren't that good. There shouldn't be any laws. Well, if there's not any laws, then, I mean, these are people that are in charge. I can't believe they get voted into uh, office. But not to have laws against breaking and entering, not to have laws against stealing, how stupid is that? that we, we live in a day and age where stupidity is on parade. And, uh, and the average citizen thinks, oh, what can I do? I'm just one voice. No, there are many voices out there. We just need to come together and, and let our voice be heard. And so, uh, but that, doesn't that describe the world, our nation, which we're living in? They despise authority while fearing it. And fear now extorts from them more than respect and love achieved, that love achieved formerly. And what he's saying there is, is in a monarchy, there were good monarchs, there were bad monarchs. Just like we have uh, good legislators, bad legislators, good judges, bad judges, good city councilmen, bad city councilmen. There's good and bad in everything. There's good ministers, there's bad ministers, there's good parents, there's bad parents. Uh, 
there's good teachers and bad teachers. Good professors, bad professors. Good presidents, bad presidents. And what he was saying was, there was, a, 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 at one time, he's referring to the love for the monarchy. And the monarchy, a good monarch, uh, loved his people and took care of them. And a bad one didn't. And that's what led to the French Revolution, by the way. But he was saying, what have we replaced it with? Now fear extorts more from them than love did previously under a monarchy. And, and that is so true. Look at, at what we're going through today. And everybody, the watchword is fear today. Everybody's afraid. Afraid. And what are they afraid of? They're afraid of... of uh, of the upheaval. They're afraid to speak out in opposition to ideas that, uh, that aren't deemed uh, worthy by the media. And by the way, I got another book uh, that I read years ago and I, I dug it out. It's on my shelf. Jockey Lule's Propaganda. And, uh, and I tell you what, he wrote that after World War II, and uh, and I tell you, it's like reading uh, something that you and I are experiencing today. But our media has become a propaganda machine. They don't report news. They create it. You need to be aware of that. You need to have that in mind, that very little of what we're getting anywhere is news. We're getting opinion. We're getting a, an agenda being pressed upon us. And so be very careful. Learn to think. Learn to reason for yourself. Uh, Tocqueville goes on to say, I observe that we have destroyed those independent beings who were capable of fighting single-handed against tyranny. But I perceive that government has inherited by itself all those powers it has wrenched from families, corporate bodies, or individuals. Thus, the power of a small number of citizens, sometimes oppressive, uh, has given way to the weakness of the whole community. The dividing up of fortunes has reduced the distance separating rich from poor, but as of the gap has grown smaller, they discovered fresh reasons for mutual hatred, casting terrified and envious glances at one another. Each seeks to deprive the other of power, for both of them equally. The concept of rights does not exist, and power appears as the sole reason for action in the present and the only guarantee for the future. Power. Does that sound like what you've heard today? The redistribution of wealth. And after it was all said and done, and, and they did away with the aristocracy in France and, and uh, established uh, the, the rights of the peasantry to pursue uh, their own wealth, they found that they, it's easier said than done. Uh, and in their system that they created, they did not have that same spirit of entrepreneurship uh, that our government afforded us through the Constitution. Uh, they were still under the mindset of controlling. It just went from control of the monarch and the corporate entities, the church, and, and the aristocracy, the families. It, they took the power from them and just a, a few kept it for themselves. And so they didn't really create anything different. Oh yeah, some poor people might have got some land, but they didn't know what to do with it. And all of a sudden they became uh, taxpayers. They were responsible uh, to produce with it and to pay taxes uh, to the government. And so they found out that 
they still had reasons for mutual hatred, Tocqueville says, and envious glances at one another. And both, rich and poor, conceived that power was going to be the real uh, currency for the future. And so uh, it, he goes on to say, the poor man has restrained most of the prejudices of the of the uh, have has retained, excuse me, most of the prejudices of the forefathers without their beliefs, their ignorance without their virtues. He has entertained the dogma of self-interest as uh, a guide for his actions, without understanding how it works, and his self-centeredness is no less blind than was formerly his devotion. To others. He became what he despised. Be careful what you wish for. And so Tocqueville is looking here uh, at France as he's inter introducing, laying down the foundation for what he's going to encounter in America. But he says, the poor are still prejudiced. You know, I've discovered this throughout my lifetime. Poor has absolutely nothing to do with the amount of money you have. People are poor not because they lack financial resources. They're poor because they think of themselves as poor. Poor is a mindset. You take somebody who has a, a, a rich mindset and has absolutely little financial resources, but he's got a drive, he's got a dream, he's got a mindset that sees opportunity. He doesn't have the mindset that sees everything holding him back. He has the mindset that sees uh, there's a great big world uh, out there. There's an opportunity. And so the rich mindset, without the resources, will eventually find the resources to support their mindset. Those who have a poor way of thinking, who are poor in their mind, will always be poor. It doesn't matter how many resources they have at their, avail at their availability. And so, he says, the poor have retained their prejudices. And... I've known people who've had great jobs, great paying jobs, and yet they still have a poverty mentality. They still look at somebody else who has maybe has more resources than them and say they don't deserve that. Uh, and so we see that being played out in our nation today. Uh, class warfare uh, is being uh, actually promoted by the political arena and the media arena and so it, it, it's a sad state in which we find ourselves but I want to encourage you today that you can change the situation you and I together and others like us we begin to think for ourselves we instead of having whatever the media and the politicians say listen they've got an agenda I have an agenda I'll just confess, I have an agenda. I, my agenda is, is that we become, go back and become the nation that our founding fathers knew that we could become. When, when the Constitution was written, when the Declaration of Independence was written, our, the, the, the framers, our founding fathers, realized that America had reached the pinnacle of those documents, that is what we were to strive for. That's what they were going to strive for. And so today we need to continue. We need to go back and try to strive for the uh, achievement that the Constitution and the direct Declaration of Independence uh, uh, is is actually that is pr promoting us and propelling us to to strive for. So I encourage you, 
if you haven't read those documents, read them. They're very moving. And, uh, and I'm not saying we need to go back and adopt. Listen, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, during uh, the uh, civil rights movement of our nation, we made great strides. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, when uh, Barack Hussein Obama was uh, voted into office, he put the civil rights movement in our country back 50 years. And, and it, it, I hear it today so often that there is systemic racism in our nation. And it's not systemic. There will always be prejudice. There will always be racism. There is, uh, it always gets Sadie worked up when I start talking about patriotic stuff. She's a very patriotic hound dog. Um, but... There's always been those things since man was created by God, uh, since uh, the fall of man, since Cain killed Abel. Uh, there's always been that prejudice, that uh, ability to look at someone else and, and, uh, and direct hatred toward them because you're disgruntled with your own life. But let me tell you something. There's one race, the human race. And I don't look at the color of a person's skin or their socioeconomic situation. Let me tell you something. And, and I believe this, that uh, our nation, if we had systemic racism, we would have never elected a black president. We wouldn't have uh, the many, many black officials that we have serving in our government, uh, all of all of our major sports, almost all of our major sports figures are of ethnic backgrounds. There is not systemic racism. There is always going to be, as long as two humans can look at each other uh, with prejudice in their heart. There'll be some kind of a, of of a, a bias uh, against them, but. We need to put this behind us, folks, because that's going to destroy us. And uh, and we had, through the 60s uh, civil rights movement, we had made great strides up until 2008. We had made great strides and uh, of, of uh, racism not even being an issue. Uh, and, I, and once again, we have affirmative action. We have all these... Uh, laws into place and it, if there was systemic racism those laws wouldn't have been put into place we have we have uh, uh, ethnicity represented on our Supreme Court so it, it's it's I agree with Morgan Freeman who said racism exists because you talk about it uh, saw him in an interview with Don Lemons of CNN and uh, he absolutely, I, I was just thrilled because I love Morgan Freeman. I love his movies he makes. Uh, he just seems to be very down to earth. I don't know what his politics are. I don't care. But in this, I agree with him. Racism exists because you keep talking about it. You keep it out in front of people. Let's give it, give it a rest and just focus on coming together and, uh, and pursuing life, liberty, and happiness. Those, that's what the Constitution guarantees. Guarantees equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. And that's what most people forget. Uh, and, and so, Tocqueville, great book. I won't read any more to you because you probably don't want to have it read to you, but uh, great book. Uh, and, and some of the stuff that he gets into, he, he very much uh, sees the success in America, democracy. He sees the success linked to Christianity. The reach of Christianity in both government at the time and in communities. And so... Uh, for all of those who say we weren't created, we weren't founded as a Christian nation, 
I will give you a Greek word, baloney. Uh, that is not true. We were founded on Christian principles. We're a Christian nation. We're a Christian nation. Uh, and we can get back to that if we put ourselves uh, and s devote ourselves uh, to the task of uh, getting back to what our founding fathers uh, established and framed for us. I like what what uh, was asked of of uh, Ben Franklin after the Constitutional Convention. He st stepped out on the steps, and a lady asked him, said, uh, "Dr. Franklin, what have we? A monarchy or a democracy?" And he says. You have a constitutional republic if you can keep it. Boy, did he hit the nail on the head. It takes work from everybody to keep our country going. Not just the politicians, not just the president, not just the Supreme Court justices. It takes everybody being engaged. Don't sit at home and watch Seinfeld. Sit at home read a book for a little while. Then you can get to your Seinfeld or whatever it is you watch. I don't, I don't watch network television. so. But uh, I encourage you, educate yourself. Uh, don't take somebody's word for it. If you're a student in college and your professor is feeding you something and it just doesn't set right, investigate for yourself. Uh, because a lot of times, unfortunately, there's an agenda there too. But this is not a surprise to God. But I do think that it's a clarion call to every citizen in our nation to get involved in politics, uh, know your history, and get out and vote. And vote for the right issues. The issues I'm voting for is the life of children. I am I'm sorry if this offends anybody, but abortion is not right. It is the taking of human life. And there have been about 66 million babies that have met their death since Roe versus Wade was passed or considered legal by our Supreme Court justices. And they're going to stand answerable one day before God. I'm voting pro-life. I'm voting for conservative values. I'm voting for law and order. Uh, I'm voting for the America that is in our Constitution. Or that our Constitution is designed to create. Not the America that burns down buildings of innocent shopkeepers that cost people in their own front yards and homes. That isn't America. That's something else, but it's not America. That's socialism. That's communism. Those are tactics straight out of, of those ideologies. And we need to be voting against that. And so uh, of, I'm voting for faith. That's how I'm voting. So, I encourage you to vote the same way. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's only one way you can vote. I know that seems opinionated, but it's true. And if you ever want to carry on a conversation, I am more than happy carrying on all kinds of conversation uh, with you. And uh, But it's important. This vote I think is very well. This presidential election is probably the most crucial in my lifetime. And in yours as well. So get out and vote. We will see you again when we talk about faith, history, and the craziness of this 21st century we're living in. God bless. Have a good rest of your week. See you later.